Welcome to today's OR Today webinar. We have a great presentation for you today featuring Michael Weissman. OR Today would like to, to thank today's sponsor, Ready Set Surgical. Ready Set Surgical solutions offer advanced scheduling, device tracking, real-time notifications, invoice reconciliation, and system reporting for OR, SPD, and supply chain personnel. For more information, please visit ReadySetSurgical.com. We want to offer a free subscription to OR Today magazine to each attendee today. For nearly 20 years, OR Today has provided perioperative and SPD professionals with up-to-date news and information about their profession. Our monthly magazine aims to educate readers about new guidelines, techniques, and equipment, as well as practical information for career, career building, problem solving, and overall well-being. To get your free subscription to our magazine, please visit ortoday.com slash subscribe. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing CE hour by the State of California Board of Registered Nursing. You can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE hour, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Michael Weissman. Michael is System Director of Sterile Processing at UCSF Medical Center. Previously, Michael was Director of sterile, Central Sterile Processing at NYU Langone Health and a staff nurse at both New York Presbyterian Hospital and University of Pennsylvania Health System. Michael, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, happy Thursday. I do understand that in today's world, we are all a little tired of staring at screens, and I do appreciate your time on the set. Uh, just introduced, my name is Michael Weissman. I am currently the System Director of Cell Processing at UCSF. I am a nurse by background, uh, completing my bachelor's from the University of Pennsylvania. And since then, I have worked in numerous areas in healthcare as a staff nurse in a pediatric ICU, heart failure unit, thoracic surgery step down unit, an OR nurse for nine years, a nurse manager of a day surgery unit and an endoscopy suite, and then moving into the sterile processing sphere. As I like to say, I have been my own customer and from every direction. I am also currently completing program for a an MBA and a Master's of Science in Business Analytics from Syracuse University. Uh, so the purpose of today's webinar is to go over the importance of OR delays, uh, and especially in our COVID-19 environment, and understand attribute, attributable costs for OR delays. So we will be going over some of the background of OR delays. We're going to look at how that relates to the current environment, examine some ca causes, cost drivers, and magnitude, and then touch on, although uh, I like to say it's touch on, but I will probably spend a large portion of my time talking about mitigation strategies. The best, uh, the purpose for this is better understanding of causes and impacts of OR delays and put you in a position to address some of these challenges head on. So operating room delays, obviously decrease the efficiency and the working environment in the perioperative suite. Uh, it impacts patient flow and resource utilization. And I like to always say the reason that we are in healthcare today is to treat patients and give them the best care possible. So a lot of the unnecessary OR delays can lead to, if it's intra-op, increased time under anesthesia, which can lead to more complications for the patient. On the patient satisfaction side, frustration, uh, revenue loss for hospitals, and additionally also frustration and dissatisfaction on the staff and hospital side as well. 
perioperative hospital areas are the costliest areas to run when um, they are approximately 40% or more of most hospitals' expenses. So they do generate a large portion of the revenue from procedures. However, when there are delays, that is extremely costly. And the costs are 2.5 times higher for hospital stays involving OR procedures than stays that do not, uh, so those medical admissions. The occurrence of OR delays range from 40% to 96% of all cases. This is a large issue, and this can be first start to the day, intra-op delays during the case or during the turnaround in between two procedures. The average surgical delay um, in studies across multiple hospitals was 24 minutes, and 88% of cases were delayed. Uh, so this is a large issue, and I know that because there are a number of you on this webinar today. Um, so why is this important now? In the, this time of COVID, in large portions of the country, there was actually a shutdown or decrease of elective procedures during the spring, which led to a large decrease of revenues for hospitals. Um, as you can see with some of the articles, COVID-19 cost hospitals up to $323 billion across the country. Uh, and this has led to hospitals laying off staff and struggling to find ways to get procedures back on and reduce costs. So how are hospitals handling this backlog of elective surgeries? Are we set up to streamline the workflow and get patients through as easily as possible in this process. Um, and so as you can see, one of the parts here is that the current back backlog of elective cases, 60 to, 60 to 70% of cases right now are newly diagnosed, but we have a backlog of 30 to 40% across the country. Uh, they believe that in, if you just wanna look at orthopedic surgeries, approximately 1 million delayed orthopedic surgeries alone uh, with a backlog of up to 16 months so that is a large time for a patient to wait uh, for their procedure and for a better life. Uh, now, when I talk about flow of getting patients through, this is from Yale New Haven's Heart and Vascular Center, where they took a look at what is necessary to get a patient through. And this is a higher level look. So we have all the inputs on this side of the patient flow coming from in the hospital, home, a transfer center or through the emergency department waiting for the procedure. Uh, most facilities, the 7.30 a.m. is your procedure start time. And this is looking at operating room, cath labs, when the procedure is complete, what's necessary to get them into a bed, whether it is a ICU bed, a recovery bed, or even going to a PACU. And you can look at the number of lines here of possible changes and ways there are delays. So the goal everyone has is to minimize this as much as possible and to get a better flow uh, through uh, the hospital, inefficient, inefficient transfer, impact uh, the outcomes. And this can lead to a high point of patient anxiety as well as staff anxiety where they wanna get the next cases into the room and patients out of the procedure areas and into a recovery space. So some of the causes of OR delays, I have highlighted the three top ones, patient tardiness, and these are patient-related delays, uh, equipment instrument-related delays, and this can be on a, the lack of availability of instrument or equipment, or being broken, or not knowing what is necessary in the room and having to adjust last minute. Communication failures, this can be anywhere from the patient not knowing the patient is ready, the not communicating to another group that there's an issue with the patient chart or somebody has to come and see them. Uh, and then some of the other smaller delays, we have limited staff ability, surgeon tardiness, and this can be for first cases or if they're seeing patients in between procedures, incomplete paperwork as I talked about, anesthesiologist delays, lab delays if labs need to be drawn or the room not being ready. Uh, there are far more delays and your facility may see other ones besides these. So when looking at the studies, this is a larger problem across the system. So from this Wong study, we can see that there, when they looked at 1,500 approximately elective neurosurgical cases, there were equipment failures in 
33% of those delays, 51% of the cases had at least one delay and 88% had, had at least one error due to those delays. Um, and in another study by Hicks et al, they looked at there was 55% of first case starts delayed for average or median, sorry, median of 12 minutes. And the patient delays in surgeon availability in this study were the most common causes. In another study, as I said, there have been a number of studies. Uh, Bauer et al looked at it. 88% of the cases that they looked at, approximately 5,500 of them were delayed. Uh, patients being late were the main driver for first cases at 65%, and the average delay time was 28.2 minutes. So if the patient arrives late, they found the odds of a delayed start to surgery increased 35%, and the odds of a delay uh, went up 9% with every 10-year increase in the patient age. Uh, patient tardiness primarily was due to lack of education and preparedness prior to surgery. So the patients not knowing where to go into the hospital, the importance of what time they were supposed to show up. Uh, and these were some of the things they found in their study. When you look at equipment related delays, um, they they're a large part of the significant uh, cause of errors in the OR. There's a disruption to the surgical flow. It's a large compromise to patient safety and increases the stress for everyone in the room, the physician, the surgical tech, the operating room nurse, nurse and the anesthesiologist. Uh, equipment malfunctions can lead to OR time delays if you need to swap out equipment. And this is if the equipment does not cause a fire, an electrical issue in the room, or something else which has to be mitigated as well. And of the 911 surgeries that were looked at by Ruben et al., um, 148 equipment-related incidences uh, occurred, so about 16%, and something which I will go into in a few minutes, but they only had approximately a, six, a 57 to 60% response rate to those to what the delays were. And it can range from instrumentation or devices, uh, with the problem being that equipment wasn't available or that equipment was broken. And 47% of the reported incidences led to a delay, um, with the majority, of, with 10% of the incidents leading to a delay of greater than 15 minutes. Uh, so, equipment-related delays also occur with the with other tertiary medical centers um, where McDonald, uh, uh, where they looked at 13 of 23 procedures were delayed. 85% of those were equipment-related. Uh, equipment delay breakdowns, as I said before, incorrect device in the room, device missing from the room, or devices broken. And this is where we start to get into the cost. And this can range due to inflation or due to the area of the country you work in. So we were looking at studies from 2013, and it was saying that each delay led to a loss of $630, uh, which looking at inflation is approximately $740 in 2019, um, with an estimated loss due to the amount of general surgery cases in 2013 of $583,000 with an extra 116 hours of operating time. And that is just from this study. Um, in other studies, they, we looked at for causes, 44% of nurses reported a lack of teamwork and communication as one of the leading causes of OR delays, which I will be talking about towards the end of this presentation. 76 communication failures occurred over 150 hours of observation. Um, most relating to equipment or updating the team members on operating room progress. If they were going to be needing a recovery room bed soon, uh, if they needed more equipment, more supplies, any lab work or any medications. First start delays. Now this is an important uh, aspect to look at because this sets your table for the rest of the day. So looking at some of the studies, when they looked at three high volume urban medical centers, 88% of the cases were delayed with an average delay being 28.2 minutes. But this is where a major problem comes in. 60% of cases had no documented reason for the delay. But documented reasons included physicians, anesthesiologists, the patient being late, staff issues, other sources being instrumentation or equipment, 
or something wrong with the facility, electrical, gas, anything like that, which was another 5%. The estimated delayed costs in this study were another $519,000. So this is a large financial stress on the system and on um, healthcare total. So looking at what a minute of OR time costs, a few of the studies uh, at Duke University, they were showing $20 a minute, uh, and that ranged up to University of Rochester with a re-estimation of $100 a minute. Um, so looking on the right side here, if you're saying on the low end, Duke losing $20 a minute due to OR delays, and an average delay being 20 minutes, uh, for every 20 minute delay, the hospital loses $400. Uh, a typical surgery center performing 19 surgeries per day with 65% delays uh, due to patient tardiness or other reasons, surgery center could potentially lose $4,800 a day or over $1.7 million a year. Um, and this, as I said, these are just estimates based on the facility uh, and the part of the country. Uh, as someone who is in California, the labor costs are much higher here as are the facility costs. So those numbers can be much higher than in other parts of the country. Um, so the other part of delays is unused OR time. If a patient is not ready to go into a procedure, if you have a long turnaround time. So each hour of OR, unused OR time costs at the University of Rochester study approximately $3,600, with each minute being $60. Uh, and that's not including lost surgeon time, lost anesthesiologist time or any opportunity cost that you may have where someone could be doing other work. In this study over a two week period, the University of Rochester lost $90,000 uh, in first start cases delayed. If you look at that over the course of a year uh, where 20, they have 20 ORs and five days per week for 50 weeks uh, with approximately having 7,500 proposed postponed or canceled first start cases annually, um, it equates to a loss of $5.9 million. And that's something that all of us in our budgets right now need to find. Um, additional an analysis uh, up this cost to actually $100 a minute. So from their original study of a loss of 5.9 million, it actually comes out closer to 9.6 million. And if you looked at that in today's cost, $13.6 million uh, of lost revenue. Uh, so the other part of this is that when you have a first case delay or turnaround delay or extended time in your operating room, you need, at, you need to use overtime potentially to cover the end of those cases where they're going past the scheduled time. Uh, in the study, it caused Rochester to go over its overtime budget by almost a million dollars, $960,000. Um, the total overtime pay for nursing staff approached $1.4 million, as I said, almost a 200% variance from the budget of $500,000. And Journal of uh, uh, Patient-Centered Research and Reviews found the average surgical delay across multiple hospitals was 24 minutes, and that 88% of cases delayed uh, if we use their lower cost estimate of $60, the, the typical delay cost this hospital $1,440. Okay, so we look at another study, and, and the other end of it, uh, which obviously my focus is being on the procedural side of it, but it's the other part is getting the patient out of the operating room and to either recovery area or ICU. So we did look at Yale New Haven study on cardiac patients, and they found that in their study, 54% of patients were delayed. Um, and these delays led to longer ICU length of stay. Those patients who were delayed stayed in the hospital longer. They had higher blood loss. They had a more, there was a higher rate of readmission within 30 days and also a higher rate of mortality within 30 days. These delays cost the hospital additional $3.5 million. And so in their study, they showed a before and after, after they've made changes to their workflows to streamline patients getting from the cardiac procedures to the ICUs, 
they they found 16% fewer patients delayed. The length of stay in the ICU went down by 19% and cost decreased by 19%. So there is a large amount of value to making these adjustments and changes. Uh, and then the final two parts of it are talking about satisfaction, first on the patient side and then on the staff side. Uh, when a patient's delayed, for the patient before procedure and for the family during the procedure, uh, we found they found in studies that the wait times decreased patient satisfaction scores and also decreased the perception of care. Um, and this is in a study that had about 12,000 respond, 11,300 respondents across 44 ambulatory sites. And the results indicate every aspect of the patient experience, um, confidence in the care provided and perceived quality of care correlated negatively with longer wait times. There is a something called a net promoter score, which they use in marketing. And what that talks about is the ability of people to influence others to come to your facility or to come to your company for care or to buy a product. And you have to look at each time that you have a dissatisfied patient that they will tell a number of people and that can decrease your revenues, decrease the amount of people who come to your facility. Someone who's dissatisfied can bring about a large change in the patient volume that comes to you. Um, and so on the staff satisfaction part, we have, this is not a highly studied aspect, but we did find at University of Wisconsin uh, that the efficiency projects to reduce turnaround time would improve satisfaction among the OR nurses, surgeon, and anesthesiologists. Uh, that they went from 51 minutes with a very with standard deviation of 20 minutes to 43 minutes uh, with a standard deviation of 19 minutes over the course of two years. And that eight minute reduction in turnaround time achieved by the OR found a 16% improvement uh, in um, efficiency. This then led also in that time frame when you look at their satisfaction surveys among their staff to nurses going from 33% to 67%, surgeons going from 22% to 59%, anesthesiologists going from 15 to 63 overall your satisfaction going from 26 percent to 63 percent people do not want to stay for the most part i'll make a joke here people do want to go home and they do want to get out of work and when they feel that they are sitting there unproductively and their time is being wasted satisfaction goes down and satisfaction goes down uh, work ethic can possibly follow as well as an increase in errors or other problems so this is where I think the most important aspect comes in. Uh, and I think why everyone here joined this webinar is not just to hear about the costs associated, but some of the things that we can do to limit that. So one of the things that you really wanna make sure is that you have a great communication chain from your facility to the patient, giving them directions, giving them the correct start time to come in. Um, you really want to increase that adherence to recommended arrival times because you have based all your workflows on the patient getting here in time. As you saw earlier, when patients arrive late, it increases the likelihood of errors and it greatly increases the likelihood of delays because people will be rushing to get those patients in. Uh, and the other part which I want to talk about, something that I have seen at numerous facilities, is that most people will, or a lot of facilities will turn around and then just have the patients come earlier, trying to build in more time to get them through. So you may have patients who come earlier and that creates a backlog in your admitting area. So one thing to look at also is, do you have enough people admitting patients? How streamlined is your admitting process? Uh, because having patients come earlier will just increase their dissatisfaction making someone come two to three hours before a procedure when they've been NPO for hours can make them very, very upset, especially if they come at five o'clock in the morning and then they still don't get in to see somebody till 6.15. So you wanna make sure that you have enough people in that admitting area. You wanna uh, leverage your supply chain, uh, SCM is the supply chain technology uh, to decrease equipment related issues. 
If you want to make sure that you have the right technology there for an equipment and instrumentation for your procedure, you want to make sure that the communication is strong on all levels and that you can track where your instruments or equipment is. You can use your instrument tracking software. Uh, there are a number of companies out there that have great ones, and you can use that to barcode your equipment as well. Uh, you can use your Apex, uh, Epic, or other electronic records to create preference cards that communicate out the needs for the cases, and so you can plan ahead better. Uh, and this gives you that advanced scheduling, proactive notifications, so you can start to look at issues ahead of time. One of the things that we have been doing at my facility is looking at the conflict list for instrumentation a week out and then the day before. So the equivalent today is a Thursday. Today at our huddle, we went over the electronic, we have a report that comes out of our instrument tracking software. We looked at tomorrow to make sure nothing had changed with the schedule, as well as looking at a week out, so next Thursday. This allows us to start planning ahead of time potentially moving patient start times or uh, changing rooms around to ensure that we have the correct equipment in the correct location and minimizing movement the day of the procedure, which can lead to other delays. And the other part which you can look at um, is tracking of instrument or equipment coming in and out of your hospital, uh, and that is communication with your vendors. I think we all have had the issue of a selective workflow where one person calls a vendor or text messages a vendor or there's an email chain and someone's left off where they're trying to say this is what's coming in this is what we need when is it arriving i would stress looking at some way to streamline that communication whether it is a set email group or utilizing the technology out there to get a better communication and tracking from the time of booking through to the time of the instrumentation or equipment arriving. Now the big one which some would say I should have talked about first and I'm now pointing out with my pointer is documenting delays. Uh, as the as a OR nurse and as a manager for an operating room, I know there are issues. Uh, I know that problems take place. Making sure that the team in the OR or the team in SPD or supply chain materials management, the physicians, if there is a delay or there is a problem, you need to know about it. Uh, there is a saying that you, sorry, uh, there is the, I like to say that if you don't know that there is a problem, you can't fix it. And a lot of time, our solu a lot of times our solutions are lean towards the symptom and not the root cause. And being able to document these delays, as you saw in some of the studies, there was only 55 to 57% response rate for the what the reason of the delay was. You have to know what the problem is so you know how to solve it. Um, and so you wanna really stress with your team, first of all, to document the delay and then also standardize how the delays are documented. And the reason why I talk about this one is you wanna to get to what the first delay is. If the, pa if the patient arrived late, and that means that, so the patient is supposed to get there at six o'clock and they get, arrive at 6.30. And the physician is normally supposed to see the patient at 6.15, but because of that, the physician doesn't see the patient at 6.40. The physician seeing the patient late is not a, the delay. The root cause of the delay is getting, is the patient arriving late. And what I have seen at some of the facilities I've worked at is that people will list every delay from the first delay on because it is behind schedule. So your team needs to understand that they need you need to know the real delays and the ones that actually cause the problems, not the further downstream delays that were created because of the original one. And this, as I said, it's important to understand causes and frequencies. I did talk about earlier that I am getting a degree with in business analytics. Data does not lie. We do live in a world of anecdotal uh, where someone will say, I have a problem, and you say, how often do you have the problem? And their answer may be, oh, this happens three times a year. And so you want to still fix that problem, but you want to make sure you understand the frequency and that you go over the ones which will quickly change your on-time start data, your turnaround data, and so on.
And the biggest thing, and this is, I have had training, I am a green belt in lean management. So this is one of the uh, aspects I like to stress with my team and when we're working with the operating room or any other procedural area is consistent workflow patterns. Uh, we do have, we know we always have that staff in every department who believes that they've been doing this for a very long time and they understand the best way to do it. But what you want is the consistent way to do it. That if I am the nurse in your room today, I will do it the same way as another nurse tomorrow or the nurse the day before. And that goes the same way for your surgical tech, for your scheduler, for the supply chain, for the uh, staff, for the SPD staff. So creating consistent workflow patterns will also allow you to see where the problem is and potentially stop problems much earlier on. Variability is the enemy of um, efficiency. It, it makes it very difficult to meet the metrics and the goals that you have set. And every time you add a level of variation or exception, that makes it that much harder for everyone to be trained to do that, as well as getting what you need into the room. Um, and so some of the things that you can do with this, uh, briefing protocols, uh, many of the, fa the facilities that I've seen successfulness have had a debriefing at the end of the procedure where everyone talks quickly about what were some of the successes and what were some of the things that have gone wrong. Uh, one of the things which I will use as an example, and this is a good way to capture, is the addition or subtraction of instrumentation from a tray. So you will have a case where a physician needed to use an extra set of clamps and they may say this was if you don't do a debriefing, the person, the staff working in the room may turn around and say, oh, they want these extra clamps in there all the time. And now you've added extra work on everybody's end, extra work with counting, extra work with reprocessing when it was really just an exception to the rule. And so having that debriefing allows you to talk about is this an exception or is this something that we need to start tracking to say we need to make a change in it? If you do change your workflow, your process every day, it does make it more difficult for staff to get trained up. So what you wanna look is the frequency of something happening, as I talked about before, data, the frequency of something happening and if you need to make that change or is this just an exception which happens every so often. This also improves team attitude sort towards safety because you can give kudos for good catches. You can talk about things, as I said, that went wrong and what you could do next time. This is creating that muscle memory for staff in any department on how to react when a situation occurs. Uh, the next thing that I talk about is checklists. Uh, I do fly quite a bit and pilots do fly by quite a bit. And what I always like to say to staff is if a, you want, Every pilot uses a checklist before they fly. They, do, they fly constantly, they've had years of training, and they still have to do a checklist. This is something which reminds you of the work which needs to be done and helps create that standard work that we talked about and improves communication. This is where you can talk about responsibilities in the room, if potential for a fire. This is where you can talk about any special equipment or needs. This is where the physician has the opportunity to say, I keep this, but don't open it. I may not need it. I will let you know when I need it. So, which is another cost savings to the facility where you can review the PRN. Right? And then the other part is team training. The more people feel that they know and the more comfortable they are in the procedure, it, impro improve, eh, sorry, it improves the processes, it improves attitudes, um, and it, it shows improves patient outcomes. Uh, so training is vitally important, and that can be just making sure everyone understands the basics, everyone is com comfortable with the communication protocols. It doesn't have to be the in-depth that everyone has to memorize every tray or every piece of equipment. That's what you have checklists for. Uh, and the big and the final one is organizational change. You really want to push towards that turn decreased turnaround time, the decrease of communication breakdown the improved perception of the safety climate and decreased operative time. That will lead to, as we talked about just a minute ago, improved patient outcomes, better attitudes among your team, better processes. I do like to speak with anecdotes a lot. And if anyone, uh, at the end, I will provide my email address if people have 
follow up questions or just want to discuss something, I like to use anecdotes. Uh, one of my favorite ones to use is actually uh, a big fat Greek wedding where the daughter wants to go to college and the mother comes out after arguing with the father and turns and says, the father may be the head, but the mother is the neck. Leadership in a facility, I feel that you are the neck and the staff are the head or the workflow is the head. And your goal is to slowly turn that staff towards what you need. You don't want to say we need to go from a turn a on time start of 60% this week to 90% next week. You want to create small incremental changes so that way people buy into the bigger change. The reason why I use the head and the neck example is if you turn too fast, you get whiplash. So what you want to do is a small change and then all of a sudden you go, the team will go, wait, how are we looking this way? Well, how did we get from here to here? and look back and you want to celebrate that success. So that is a big part of that organizational change. Um, in summary, all of these, and I want to make sure that we left enough time for questions. Um, in summary, the operating room delays, uh, they decrease efficiency and they make a less happy and a less efficient working environment. This impacts the patient flows, as we talked about patient satisfaction, patient outcomes, and also resource utilization, which is another part of the big driver of cost to the facility. OR occurrence, uh, the occurrence of OR delays ranges, as we said, from 40 to 96%. I actually believe it is on the high end of that and that we, we have reporting fatigue. But as I said before, you really want to stress with your team, please let us know what the problems are. If you don't know what the problem, are, problem is, you can't fix it. And another part which I didn't talk about, and I'm glad I put this here to remind myself, is also there's an accountability on you as a leader, anyone who's on here who's a leader, that you need to communicate back to your team that you're acknowledging these problems, and then also what is being done to fix these problems, whether that is bringing that staff member in to help on the project, or just communicating out to say on a board or in the huddles, this has been happening, this is who we are working with, and I will have an update by this day. You give that ETA, and then you give the, an update on that day. You can come in, you can say, I will let you know by Monday what's going on. If you do not have the answer on Monday, you can say, I know I promised everyone an answer today. We need another five days. I will let you know by Friday. Because of what happens and the reason that people are not communicating is a lot of times they think it doesn't matter. It won't make a difference or they fail to understand the importance of that. And that's on us as leaders to stress that to our team. Uh, some of the delays that we looked at and we talked about patient tardiness, uh, and that also is patient, a slow patient movement from the getting them from the waiting room into the admitting area and then from the admitting area to the procedural area. So I do include patient tardiness that way. Uh, equipment related issues, and that is equipment and instrumentation. As the director of SPD, I usually start my conversations with, I'm sorry. It's just a natural reaction at this point, uh, because you, what you, but what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are streamlining and you are focusing on those because they are extremely preventable with good communication, uh, which we talk about in a second with communication failures. Surgeon tardiness is another part, but what I will say is the surgeons, when you are talking to them on this, they will want to they will say, what is the point? So if you have really bad turnaround time, there is a delay later, the surgeon will turn to you and say, I had to get here at six o'clock in the morning to check this patient in as you asked, but then all these things happen and my delay is shot, my day is shot and now I'm here till 9 p.m., I'm missing dinner with my family and they are less likely to work with you on that next one. So you, I like to push that surgeon tardiness actually to a later project because you wanna show them the improvements and you don't want to lose them by failing when they make the steps to help you out. Um, and then staff av availability is another one seen in high frequencies and that can be for staff call outs, that can be for lack of planning and not having the correct staffing there, or that can be because your delay ran, your day ran so late, it has delayed and you have less availability of staff at the end of the day. 
as we talked about, that patient tardiness is primarily due to lack of education. So you really want to look at what is going on in your pre-op phone calls. Does there need to be a printed out map provided to the patient so they know where to go when they come in? We are living in a virtual world these days, and perhaps you want to create a virtual video that you share with them on this is what it will look like as you're coming in. And that might make it easier for someone. Uh, hospitals are very confusing places. Uh, most of them, especially on the coast, where you have limited resources and limited space, are multiple buildings that have been built at different times and connected. There has been a hospital I worked at that to get from one end of the building to the other end, which was a block away, you had to go take the elevator from the eighth floor to the fifth floor, walk down two hallways, take another elevator back up to the sixth floor, go down a hallway, and then take an elevator down to the second floor to get where you're going. It was a maze of up and down. And you want to look at that as, is there a streamlined uh, pathway for that patient when they're coming in? Is there a color-coded pathway? Are the signs large enough? Is it, especially as we saw those delays go up as the patients get older? And you want to make sure that that communication fits all age groups visually, or it can be something which is auditory as well. Um, in one study, as we said, 85% of the OR delays were equipment related. That's $739 per delay accounting for inflation. Uh, it is, these are costly things, and especially if that delay is due to instrumentation, and I would say that uh, as the director of SPD, if there is something which requires reprocessing, that can raise the cost significantly where you are looking at the cost per trade or process, or the cost of extra equipment that you now purchase. Uh, is it cheaper to streamline your workflows or to buy that third microscope? And my answer, I think, every time would be, let's streamline our workflows, and if we still see we need that third microscope, then let's buy it. Uh, because that is a large expenditure, first on purchasing equipment, and then on service contracts. As we talked about, uh, the cost per minute of OR delays can range anywhere from $20 to 100, and that really is dependent upon your facility. And I would work, if you need justification for stuff, I would work with your finance team to look at what are the costs facility-wise, utilities, staff salaries, physician salaries, all these things to come up with a number so that you can then justify and show your victories when you win of how much money you have saved the hospital. Um, we talked about cost of delayed cases ranging from $2,000 to $3,000. Uh, and that's accounting for inflation, but as I said, depending on the part of the country, and that can also change drastically. Uh, delays in patient transferring from the OR to the ICU, and some of the studies associated with uh, increased length of stay, higher blood loss, increased uh, readmission and mortality rates. But also, as we said, there weren't a lot of studies going from the OR to the PACU or recovery area, but that is another if you have that issue with the ICU, I guarantee you have that issue with the PACU as well. And you want to really start to look at your flow for beds throughout the hospital and planning ahead for admissions and making sure you can decrease those overnight stays or extended stays in the PACU or the ICU, which slows down movement of patients. And these wait times, as we talked about, not only impact overall patient satisfaction, uh, but also affect the perception of the care you're given. You can be giving the best care possible, and if you are not communicating well and that patient has a large delay, they will go and tell five of their friends and family members of the issues they had when they had a procedure in your facility. And this can then lead to less referrals, which would lead to a decreased volume, and as we said, decreased volume is decreased revenues. And also, as we talked about uh, staff satisfaction, reducing turnaround time. Uh, there are some people who like being at work. I know some people who work, OT, call, you know, they are the big earners in the hospital and they do that on purpose. But most people do want to go home. They want to see their families. They want to go do activities. They may have school uh, or other things outside of work. And if they feel that they are constantly being stuck at work, delayed in cases, it will decrease their staff satisfaction, which may increase staff turnaround or turn, sorry, turnover which would mean that you have to do more training and you're constantly bringing in new staff, which doesn't give you the time to work on those processes and, and fix things. So really looking at some of those mitigation strategies that we did talk about. And what I wanna stress right here is that 
I don't have all the answers because every facility is different. Uh, I never, I always say to people, do not look at, you can look at what somebody else does, but this is not a franchise. Every hospital is different. Every workflow is different. When I started, uh, I started a year ago at UCSF where I moved over here and I walked into the department and I was talking with staff and I said, I know SPD and I know how SPD works, but I don't know how your SPD works. Do you want to really go in with that open mind of, I don't have all the answers. You can't put a square peg into a round hole, or if you do, you're going to break something. So you really want to make sure that you're looking at what are the problems at my facility. And if you have multiple facilities, each one may be different. There may be, it may be a long distance in between the waiting area and the admitting area. It may be that you don't have enough of, uh, washers and your SPD to properly turn things around. Your storage facility may not be enough. Um, these are a lot of things to look at across the board and all of them can help you. Um, so I do want to thank everyone. I wanted to make sure to leave time for questions and answers. If anyone does have a follow-up question that, or would like to discuss with me, I am giving my email address. As you can see, I do like to talk and I like to talk about this. I find it very interesting. So please reach out to me if you do have any follow-up questions and I would, or any questions which are not answered today, and I would love to work with you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Michael, for a fantastic presentation. We do have a few questions that have come in, and we'll answer those in just a few moments. But for the audience, if you do have any questions at this time, please use the question function on the GoToWebinar dashboard. Our first question, uh, Michael, is what has been your experience at UCSF on addressing the causes of OR delays? Uh, oh boy, I don't know if we have enough time for me to answer this question. Uh, and so this is one of the, um, there are a number of delays at my facility. Uh, as I said, every facility is dealing with similar problems. Um, some of them were availability of instrumentation. Uh, as a SPD director, this is something that I was able to work on internally at first. Uh, when I started at the facility, we did have a large amount of instruments that were not processed each morning. And what we did is we flexed our assignments and our workflows, and that allowed us to actually zero out each morning. So what that meant is while we gave coverage to the working with the OR on fixing preference cards, on fixing communication, because if something was wrong, at least the instrument tray was available. Uh, and that allowed us to start partnering with the OR on new uh, processes. So we started picking earlier in the day, going from picking at 3 p.m. to picking at 8 a.m. in the morning. This gave more time to everyone to start meeting for a daily huddle at 10.30 every morning, uh, which increased our communication, increased our processes. Uh, currently, we actually had a meeting yesterday with the OR where we were looking at leveraging our instrument tracking software better for a real-time conflict check on what the instruments are um, that are needed for the cases and where we would need to pivot, borrow instruments, or potentially change the case schedule as is necessary. So. Uh, there have been a lot of improvements in that way. Right now, also, we are part, we are working, and this is one of the suggestions which I gave earlier. Uh, one of our facilities, there was a large amount of, there was a delay with getting patients from the waiting area into the prep area. And what we, they, the first suggestion was, let's get them there earlier. So now instead of a patient coming at six o'clock in the morning, let's get them there at 5.30. But when we went and looked at it, we actually saw patients were getting there on time, but they were the time the time stamp in between when they arrived and when they were actually seen by one of the admitting individuals for that final check before going to the prep area was extremely long. It could have been sometimes it was an hour and fifteen minutes. So instead, what we did is we moved some of the admitting individuals, uh, those schedulers, uh, sorry, not schedulers, the administrative individuals. We moved them earlier. So instead of having one at 6 a.m., one at 6.30, and one at 7, we actually moved all three to arrive at 6 a.m., and we saw an increase in one of our sites from an on-time start of 
approximately 27% to 64%. And that is over just a two month period this summer. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, our next question is, do you have uh, any other thoughts on why equipment related delays are so high? Uh, I do, and I think this one really comes down to communication. Uh, the, there's, uh, sorry, two parts to it. I always say one thing, and then I, I say there's going to be one thing, and then I say three things. So one of the, uh, some of the big things are knowing what your inventory is, having a correct tracking, and then having the correct predictor models for what is needed, and then a communication pathway to talk about any deviation or any changes which need to be made. I would highly recommend that anyone here, if you don't already, uh, utilize an instrument tracking software and an equipment tracking software. These can be one and the same. As I said, if you wanna reach out, I will talk to you about how we've leveraged instrument tracking for the equipment as well throughout a facility, but you wanna know what you have and where it is. The other part of that is the communication to say, this is the case that is coming, this is what I need for it. Uh, I was talking to one of my um, peers who works at another facility. Uh, they are on the perioperative side and they had moved to a new facility. And the OR staff were talking about how the case carts were always incorrect. And when they looked into it, and this had been going on for years, what they found is that the preference cards had not been updated in the system for five years and that the OR nurses were working off of a Word file of what they needed. So the SPD was not picking the correct instruments because they were unaware of the changes that had occurred to the preference cards. And there was, once that change was made where the preference cards were updated, they also saw a large uh, increase in on-time starts and a large increase in staff satisfaction. Great, thank you. Our next question is, which of the mitigation strategies have been effective for you at UCSF? I, my preference, and the first one I always go with, is standard operating procedures. If you have standard operating procedures, you can make sure that the work is being done efficiently in the same way every time. So on the SPD side, and I've done this before with the peri at the operating room side, one of the first things that I do with my educators is we start reviewing the policies and updating them, and then off of that building standard operating procedures. Uh, we all know on every aspect of perioperative services, there is the superhero who knows all the answers and can resolve any issue. But when that person is off or on vacation or uh, just as, you know, for any reason, or they retire or go on to another facility, all of a sudden there's a large vacuum of knowledge behind them. And what we wanna make sure is that no matter who you call, whether it's in the OR, whether it's in the PACU, admitting area, in sterile processing or supply chain, that that person knows the correct protocols and does it the same way as everybody else. That repetition speeds up processes, people know what to expect, but when you go out of that standard operating procedure, and I do understand exceptions do happen. But when you have that staff member who does their own thing, that variation leads a lot of times to errors and delays. It's a great question, thank you. Sure, okay. Um, a couple more. Uh, next is, what accounts for the range of dollar per minute estimates that you pointed out during your presentation? Uh, and this is something which varies across the country and each facility. So number one is facility cost, and you want to look at the area and what it costs to have that room or to build that facility, uh, and that is a larger picture. But on the smaller scale, you want to look at utility costs, supply costs, equipment costs, and staffing costs as well. And I think the staffing cost is the big change. Uh, what somebody may make in, and I know I've worked in New York and San Francisco, what someone may make in a major metropolitan area can potentially be much higher than what someone is making in a rural area. Um, and I've seen that flipped also because you're trying to draw staff to that area.
but they, I think the main driver of that ends up actually being staffing costs. Utility costs are fairly similar, but it depends if you have a unionized environment or a non-unionized, uh, the, wage, the wage rate, and also you want to look at length of time. So how long does it take someone to do that activity? So if anyone does want to reach out, I can discuss units of service with you and how best to measure that. And that is, what are the tasks somebody has to do? How long does it take to do it? And then equating that to how many FTEs you need to get that work done on a regular basis. All right, great, thank you. Um, next question is, do you notice a difference with staff by better managing OR delays? Uh, yes, I think this is something that um, everyone would see when you make improvements like that. If staff feel that nothing is getting better, uh, if they feel that they are stuck at work, they're being mandated OT, especially if you are a staff member in an operating room, you can't just walk out of an operating, you can't say, oh, it's three o'clock, it's time for me to go if there's no relief for you. So when somebody knows that their day is about to get ruined because at 7.30 in the morning there was a problem and they go, junk, I was supposed to meet somebody for dinner or a concert or I have to pick up my kids from school, any one of the numerous activities someone may have, that instantly leads to a dissatisfaction. Um, the other part of it is also getting your team to work together. So there sometimes is the feeling in different areas that they alone are doing it and nobody else supports them. And getting your team to actually see the other person's point of view is really valuable. So having an OR nurse or surgical tech go see what it's like in admitting or go down to SPD, having the SPD staff see what it's like in the operating room, because you may be calling from the OR to say, I need this right away. And they're taking their time and they're stopping to talk to people, not understanding that 30 seconds in an operating room feels like eight years. And you're just sitting there going, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So having everyone understand the, what somebody else is going through helps. And then the final part, when you start to have these improvements um, with better managing, you also have to start to have better collaboration between the areas. And you start to see people smiling more, greeting each other. But when things are not going well, it ends up being a more contentious environment. And as I said, that can lead to more delays and more problems. Great, thank you. That is all the time that we have for today, but thank you again, Michael, for a wonderful presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone today to visit our sponsor, Ready, Set, Surgical, to learn more about the products and the services that they provide to our industry. Visit readysetsurgical.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one, after, one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE hour, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back in two weeks with another webinar. Visit ortoday.com slash webinars for more details and for complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great day.